Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the MIT's Compton Lecture. I'm delighted, truly delighted, to see so many of you here with us today. And we look forward to a very lively Q&A session with our speaker following her lecture. Let me begin with some context. In 1957, MIT established the Compton Lectures to honor the memory of MIT's 10th president, Carl Taylor Compton. He served MIT as president from 1930 to 1948, 18 years, guiding the institute with a steady hand through the Great Depression and World War II. His presidency was transformative. He helped MIT grow past its beginnings as an outstanding technical school for training hands-on engineers to become a great global university. Carl Thompson was a distinguished physicist, and he brought MIT a new focus on fundamental scientific research. He established a principle that this community now takes for granted, that the most profound and exciting innovations are born when science is the equal partner of engineering. And during World War II, he also helped invent a partnership between the federal government and America's research universities a partnership that has helped drive the nation's economic growth for almost 70 years. President Compton was known for many qualities. His steady temperament in the face of adversity, his vision, his global outlook, his humanity, and his commitment to serving the common good. So it is fitting that we honor his legacy today with a speaker who embodies these same qualities, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde. As leader of the IMF, Madame Lagarde is charged with monitoring and diagnosing the fiscal and economic health of its member nations, all 188 of them. That is a difficult job on a good day. And since she took over in 2011, the global economy has experienced a great many complicated days. The struggle over the Greek debt, the new landscape in global oil markets, the slowdown in the Chinese economy, the continuing migrant crisis in the US and the EU, I'm sorry, and more. Through it all, with steady optimism, candor, and even wit, she has demonstrated a remarkable ability to bring the right players together and to keep the global economy on track. As we will hear today, she also takes a broad view of what topics should concern the head of the IMF, not just fiscal policy, but all the forces that combine to shape our human future, from an aging population to discrimination to income inequality to climate change. Madame Lagarde's career is impressive by any measure. And I find it even more remarkable that while managing minor assignments like steering the global economy, she has led the way as a woman in professional settings much too long dominated by men. Through more than two decades at the international law firm Baker McKenzie, she rose to become the first woman to chair its global strategy committee the firm's top job. In 2005, then President Sarkozy of France asked her to join his government, and she went on to become the first woman to serve France as finance minister, which incidentally made her the first woman to hold that position in any G7 country. She's the first woman ever to lead the IMF, and a few weeks ago, she was reelected unanimously to serve a second five-year term. I will close with a small story that Madame Lagarde sometimes tells herself. When she was a young lawyer interviewing for her first job, one firm told her on the spot that she would never make partner. When she asked why, they said that it was because she was a woman. As she tells the story, I thanked them, walked out the door, and never looked back. 
Madame Lagarde, I expect there has been some former law firm interviewers looking back with regret since then. It is clear that they did not deserve you. But it is our great good fortune that you felt that the MIT community deserved your time this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Managing Director of the IMF, Madame Christine Lagarde. And thank you very, very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you very much, President Reif, uh, for your kind introduction. And thank you to all of you, the students and the faculty members, for being here uh, on this Friday afternoon uh, for, I think, a, a moment of exchange between us. But thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, it's very, very nice. It's, it's actually a tremendous honor to have the privilege to uh, deliver the, the Compton Lecture. And to be, it's one of my other firsts, I think the first French woman to give that lecture. <laughs> right? OK. <laughs> Quel honneur. Now, in many ways, this visit uh, is really a visit to our alma mater. Now, why do I say that? It's just quite remarkable that our five last chief economists all received a doctoral, doctoral training here at MIT. Ken Rogoff, Raghu Rajan, Simon Johnson, my dear compatriot Olivier Blanchard, whom I found when I got my job in 2011, and he found me. And he said, I didn't chose you, you didn't chose me, but let's give it a try. <laughs> and of course now, Maurice Opsfeld, also known as Maury, who took the helm of our research department uh, last year. Now these economists are not only leaders in their fields, but they also embody the MIT spirit, and I have seen that firsthand, of intellectual honesty and openness and relentless curiosity, even if that intellectual honesty actually comes with its cost. Now, through their work at the IMF, these MIT alumni have played a crucial role in promoting, promoting the global public good of economic and financial stability, which is precisely and has been the mission of the IMF for the last 70 years. It's been our raison d'etre. And indeed, if the IMF had a motto, we don't have one actually, we could probably borrow the motto of the MIT, mens et manus, the mind and the hands. Because both institutions are keenly aware that the best research, the grandest ideas, are those that can change our lives, our economies, our nations for the better. And both institutions are keenly aware that this requires rolling up one's sleeves and tackling problems hands-on in the lab, in the startups, in the offices, and whenever we give advice to policymakers. In short, both our institutions are deeply committed to serving the world, serving the world in the 21st century. When I look at our 21st century, demographic change is one of the first features that come to my mind. Think about it. The population at present is roughly 7.5 billion people. 40 years from now, a little over one generation away, it will be an estimated 10 billion inhabitants. And in some parts of the world, especially in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, populations will continue to grow rapidly. Other parts of the world, including most advanced and emerging market economies, will face a momentous transition towards aging and shrinking populations. And indeed, by the end of this century, about two-thirds of all countries are expected to have 
declining population. Now, this will have profound impact on economics, financial markets, social stability, and geopolitics. Without action, public pension and health systems will not be sustainable over the long term. Without action, our grandchildren would face unsustainable public debt and sharp tax increase that would stifle growth and reduce the economy well-being. As Albert Einstein once said, and I quote him, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So we need to reframe the debate about demographics. And I believe that this challenge can be met. But it will require the right policies, the political resolve, and the strong leadership. And I will argue that the fiscal policy responses and technological innovation, those are the two directions that I will explore briefly. There are many other layers of investigation, analysis, and thinking that we could apply to that issue, but I will refrain from that. I will concentrate on the fiscal side and the innovation side. Because these two are important, or can be important part of the solutions. So let us start by looking at the sunny, what I call the sunny side of demographics. Picture yourself now, together with your grandchildren. You may be in your 70s, but you are physically active, not afraid to impress those kids with your new Instagram account <laughs> or knowledge about gravitational waves. Well, maybe you have a different vision of those golden years. But surely we can agree on one thing. Being able to lead long and healthy lives is a demographic dream come true. And by any standard, this is one of our most astonishing achievements. So let's see what it translates into. First of all, life expectancy is up. Second, fertility is down. Third, global per capita income is higher. John Maynard Keynes, one of the two founding fathers of the IMF, coined the phrase, in the long run, we are all dead. Now, happily, the long run is a lot longer than in his days. Because in his days, average life expectancy around the world was barely 45. Actually, to be precise, it was 47 in 1950. It has now jumped to 71. And of course, life expectancy will vary from one country to the other, from one region to the other, from a low 61 in Africa to a high beyond 80 years in advanced economies, particularly in Northern America, Japan, and Western European countries. And few people would actually be prepared to swap their life today with an earlier existence. In the late 19th century, for example, the typical American household could expect to see almost one in four children die in infancy. And people suffered from disease that are easily cured today when they're still around. The difference between then and now lies in a powerful combination of factors, not necessarily the most exhaustive, detailed, sophisticated research, no, but improved sanitation, the introduction of antibiotics and vaccines, expanded education, better infrastructure and healthcare, to name just a few. So that's for life expectancy. And you see the link with innovation already. Now, that increase in life expectancy and economic welfare that came with the Industrial Revolution brought with it the seeds of demographic change. In what we call today the advanced economies, it started with a pronounced drop in fertility rate in the second half of the 19th century, and that has continued today. At the risk of oversimplifying somebody who is not from here, 
the University of Chicago, I'm afraid. <laughs> Gary Becker. The decline in fertility rate was related to changes in economic circumstances that increased the financial returns to education. To put it simply, it became rational for families to invest in their children's education, and families increasingly opted for raising fewer, better educated children instead of a larger, less so educated number of children. There is also ample evidence that children of better educated mothers do better in terms of health and education. And there is also ample evidence that educated women tend to have fewer children and devote more time to each child while they enjoy broader opportunities with their own life. This virtuous circle that started in Europe and the United States more than 100 years ago is now widely seen across the world. Not in all countries yet, regrettably, but it is spreading. Fertility rates have come down. In 1950, the average woman bore five children. Now she raises two and a half. When I say a woman, it's because she's associated with fertility. But luckily, the raising of children is not just a woman's job. Sorry, gentlemen. Over the same period, the global literacy rate jumped from 36% to 83% today. So, life expectancy longer, fertility rate lower. Now we come to the global per capita income, which has been up. It has had a large positive effect on economic well-being. Average incomes in emerging market economies, such as China and India, have risen much faster than those in the richest countries. Since the 1990s, the growth momentum has spread to more than 70 developing countries. And as a result, global inequality, two words matter, global inequality, that is income inequality between countries, not within country, has fallen steadily over the past decades. And global income per capita has nearly quadrupled since the end of the Second World War. Global poverty has come down as well, sharply. People living at or below the poverty line of $1.9 per day account for 13% of the world's population, down from 40% in 1981. China alone has lifted more than 750 million people out of poverty in the last three decades. The bottom line, emerging and developing countries have been catching up with advanced economies in facilitating longer and more prosperous lives for their citizens. Although that rate, that speed and pace of convergence has been slowing down lately. Now, I mentioned global inequality, and I repeated global inequality because this is the, the inequality between countries. On the other hand, inequality within countries, in most cases, has worsened uh, in the recent uh, times, less so, but starting from a much lower base in Latin America. So that was the sunny side of demographics. What's the darker side? Well, with declining fertility rates, populations in some advanced economies did not just grow more slowly, they stagnated. They stagnated or began to shrink. And the same will eventually happen as well with some of the large emerging market economies. Japan and Germany's population, for example, started to decline some time ago. And even the world's most populous country, China, has been facing a declining working age population since 2012 now. And in most cases, shrinking and aging go hand in hand. And it's a demographic double whammy that will have major implications for economic growth, financial stability, and the public purse. And that's what I would, I would like to have a look at now. First, the impact on growth. For obvious reasons, older workers participate less in the labor market, and a country with an aging and shrinking population will therefore see lower growth over the medium term. Fewer, fewer workers also means less need to equip them with capital, 
and countries may become reluctant to upgrade their capital stock. Why would I build more infrastructure if there are fewer people? That's one of the debates we're having at the moment as to the need to invest in infrastructure. Our research suggests that the combination of aging and shrinking will reduce potential growth in advanced economies by about 0.2 percentage points in the medium term and by twice as much in the emerging economies. Now, you'll say 0.2%, you know, what is this? Well, it's actually a lot in those parts of the world, such as uh, the European Union, for instance, the Euro area more specifically, where growth is roughly on average at the moment 1.5. And that is particularly the case for those countries that are facing very high debts. So what's the impact on the financial markets? Many, I'm sure that you're doing some research on that, I hope so. But many see population aging as a significant drag on asset prices. Some even hypothesize, hypothesize that retiring baby boomers may trigger stock market disruptions because they may very well liquidate the equity in order to finance their retirement. Now, this may or may not be true, but what we definitely know is that governments, pension funds, and individuals actually seriously underestimate the, pros the prospect of people living much longer than anticipated. IMF analysis suggests that if everyone lived only three years longer than expected, pension-related costs could increase by 50% in both advanced and emerging economies. And this would heavily affect private and public sector balance sheets and could also undermine financial stability. Third, what is the impact on fiscal health? Again, our research shows that in advanced economies alone, age-related spending is projected to jump from 16.5% of GDP today to 25% by the end of the century, unless action is taken. So how can these challenges be met? There are not many, many options. You can try to meet those challenges through borrowing. And if governments were to finance the entire increase in age-related expenditure that I have just mentioned, public debt would explode from an average at the moment of about 100 on a global basis to 400. 400% of GDP by the end of the century. So that's one option, doesn't seem particularly appealing. Another option is through tax, higher tax. Well, in my hypothetical, this would mean lifting VAT tax by roughly 20 percentage points or increasing social security charges by about 25 percentage points. Not very appealing either. Okay. Through drastic entitlement reforms. Well, by our calculations, that would mean slashing pensions and health benefits by an average of a third. Not very appealing either. Now, there is a wide variety of country experiences, but broadly speaking, emerging markets and advanced economies face similar challenges. And without action, China's spending on pension and healthcare is projected to increase by 13 percentage points of GDP by the end of the century, compared with an increase of 15 percentage points in the United States. So, if those three options, traditional options, are not working, what do policymakers have in their toolbox? What can they think of in order to address those challenges? And at this point in the lecture, that's where Groucho Marx would jump up and ask, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for us? Now, of course, we don't need Groucho to remind us that politicians um, generally don't look way beyond the next election, let alone the next 85 years, assuming they have common sense. <laughs> now, 
Now, the real question that is addressed to the silver generation that uh, we all are or will be one day is, is there a silver bullet? And the answer to that is very much like my darling Normandy, which is where I come from, peut-être bien oui ou peut-être bien que non, which is maybe yes, but maybe not. Very much like the economist, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand. <laughs> so common sense first tells us that simply increasing the fertility rate could help. So what's in the toolbox of the, of the policymakers? Well, many countries have actually tried. Baby bonuses, family allowances, tax incentives, parental leave, subsidized childcare, flexible work schedules, you name it. And what is the result? Well, these measures in the main have actually helped women go back to work. Which is great news in and of itself. But they seem to have very little effect on the number of births. So bribing children, bribing people to have children doesn't work. At least in the aggregate. And that is why we need a multi-pronged approach. In other words, it's not enough to focus on just one aspect, such as pushing through a pension reform. We need game changer, changers. So first game changer is entitlement, entitlement reform. And on that front, we have to start with what costs the most to the public purse, and that is healthcare, by a long way. A few options. Increasing competition amongst insurers and service providers will certainly help. But it also requires more targeted spending, paying more attention to primary and preventive health care, promoting healthier lifestyles, and making more effective use of information technology and innovation. For instance, costs can be reduced by making greater use of health data history or using unique health identifiers for individuals. And that's where, again, we touch on innovation. If these efforts could be sustained, both on the competition front, on the targeted and better use of public spending, and on the use of innovation, well, it would certainly help government to bend the cost curve. Another priority is lifting retirement age to match longevity gains. This would bolster the pension scheme and extend the, product, the productive life of individuals. But while doing that, policymakers have also to be very careful to put in place a social safety net that will protect actually those that cannot, for physical or mental reason, actually work longer. Pension systems need to be flexible enough to respond to those demographic shifts. There are existing systems in place. The Japanese system, for instance, automatically slows the growth of benefits to offset increases of life expectancy and changes in the labor force. Other countries, such as Germany, Finland, Portugal, also link benefits to life expectancy. And again, the sooner the, re the reform, the fairer the adjustment. More broadly, in the current environment of already depressed aggregate demand, we need very savvy, very targeted, and very sophisticated uh, fiscal policies, one that supports demand while ensuring sufficient savings in pensions and healthcare. So that's my first proposed game changer. Using all the tools, all the uh, angles from which to actually work on those entitlements, keep them at the most efficient level, but efficiency is the key and competition is actually helpful because there are, in that sector, quite a few rent seekers, as we all know. The second game changer is better tax systems and more efficient public expenditure. On the tax side, this means broadening the base for value-added taxes, less holes in the cheese, improving taxations of multilateral corporations and strengthening tax compliance to ensure that everybody participates in 
financing that public purse. Now, there's a lot going on at the moment. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in tax, what is happening on the front of automatic exchange of information, BEPS, uh, which is base erosion and profit shifting, all of that is aiming to actually better define and uh, assess the base on which taxation is levied. On the spending side, there must be better management of public investment. Our research shows that the most efficient public investors get twice the growth bang for their buck than the least efficient. And you can wonder what happens in between the most efficient and the least efficient. A lot of leakages. And of course, in that context, energy pricing is key, not only for the public purse, but for the planet. And this means more emphasis on energy taxation, less reliance, if at all, on energy subsidies, particularly the fossil fuel energy subsidies. Our estimates, and there may be difference in this room because I know that some research work has been conducted, but our estimate is that global energy subsidies amounted to $5.3 trillion last year. $5.3 trillion last year, which is 6.5% of global GDP. That's a huge amount. It's not just direct subsidies. It's all the spillover and consequential uh, derivatives, if you will, of the use of those subsidies. And this staggering number, we believe, I believe very strongly, need to come down. Because instead of subsidizing the use of fossil fuel energy in particular, it might be a lot better for those countries that currently spend that money to actually spend it on health and education. And it's the very perfect moment to remove those subsidies and to put in place taxation on energy because prices are so low. So that was my second game changer. My third game changer is a broad-based push to lift potential growth, to increase the size of the pie. Because in the end, there is only so much that tax measures can do, only so much that competition can remove, and only so much that innovation can improve as well. One way to grow the pie is, of course, to add more workers. But with shrinking and aging populations, it's a bit difficult. Yet, there are reservoirs of workers. And I would mention one in particular, and that obvious group is women. Scandinavian countries, and more recently Japan, have sought to raise female labor participation with some success by offering affordable childcare, making tax and legal systems fairer for women, and promoting equal pay for equal work, as well as, of course, having maternity leave available. Our research indicates that raising female labor participation rates to those of men could increase GDP by 5% where? In the United States of America. And the numbers are obviously much higher in other corners of the world. Another source of additional labor, in addition to women, is immigration. Now, of course, and particularly in view of what is happening in Europe at the moment, the associated political and social issues are not to be underestimated and they can be daunting. But from a purely economic perspective, immigration can boost a country's labor force, encourage investment, and lift growth in the short and in the longer term. And that is so only provided that these workers, those migrant workers, are well integrated into the labor force. And that's a big, big caveat. Now, you might ask, why is growing the pie so important? Well, because there's more to share now. But also because higher growth means a fuller public purse and a more potent fiscal policy response to this demographic challenge. Now, there is, of course, an essential ingredient for growth, and that is the residual of it all, which is raising labor productivity by using even smarter technology. And if there is one place where that is obvious, it's here at MIT. You know a few things about innovation. 
And indeed, I believe that it's largely the business of MIT to promote technological innovation, which is essential to raising living standards over the long term. As we can all live long and prosper. <laughs> Artificial intelligence, robotics, genetic engineering, 3D printing, quantum computing, those are only a few of the technologies that could potentially affect our economic well-being in the 21st century, in and of themselves, but even more so if they are combined together. Could these innovations revolutionize the allocation of labor and capital? Yes, say some, the optimists. And I'm thinking here of Eric Brynjolfsson, of Andrew McAfee from the Sloan School here at MIT, who argue that technical advances will have transformational consequences, leading to accelerating productivity and increasing prosperity. In other words, the pie grow a good deal by itself, and everybody enjoys more leisure. You can sign me up on that one. Well, maybe not so fast, because there are a few pessimists out there, too. First among these is perhaps Robert Gordon, who also got his PhD from MIT under the supervision of Robert Solow, almost 50 years ago. According to Professor Gordon, the century between 1870 and 1970 was unique in inventing electricity, gas, the internal combust, 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 combustion engine, the engine, <laughs> running water, sewers, telephone, antibiotics, I would add the washing machine, and much else. In his view, the technical progress achieved since then, since then, 1970, as admirable as it was, and it is, is simply not visible in productivity growth. Now, which of these two views is correct? The optimist or the pessimist? Nobody knows. By the way, do you know the difference between the pessimist and the optimist? None. They both get it wrong, but the optimist is happier. <laughs> so you know where I stand. One thing for sure, though, is that we don't need less innovation. We need more of it. Powerhouses like MIT have been leading the way for decades, including through partnerships with major corporations, as I was told earlier this afternoon when I visited the Media Lab. But governments also need to play their part by removing barriers to competition, cutting red tape, and investing more in education and research and development. This would unleash entrepreneurial energy and help attract private investment in ideas that are new, surprising, and useful. And this is particularly true as far as fundamental research is concerned, where the output is not guaranteed and the long term is necessary. In addition to supporting universities and research networks, governments typically provide subsidy for private sector R&D as well, by way of tax incentives or otherwise. More investment in R&D means bigger benefits for the wider economy. New IMF research shows that if advanced economies were able to ramp up R&D by the private sector through those incentives, through those tax credits, by 40% on average, they could increase their GDP by 5% in the long run. Innovation is also critical outside the advanced economies. For example, China is today number one in the world in terms of patent applications. And more and more multinationals outsource part of their research and development to countries like Brazil and India. Now, to be fair, a bit actually like Japan 40 years ago, which is certainly not doing that anymore. But many of the developing countries still rely considerably on imitation and absorption of technologies from others, including in advanced technologies. And one might wonder at that point whether it is in our collective global interest to actually stand on our 
intellectual property rights to protect and defend against this imitation and copying trends that we observe in many developing countries, or whether it would not be more beneficial to organize the sharing of those inventions and those technologies, including through foreign direct investment, trade reforms, investment in education, and a more subtle, better targeted enforcement of intellectual property rights. And if this were to happen, it would be also a game changer. So let me conclude on this idea of sharing. The life motto of Carl Taylor Compton, MIT's ninth president, was leave every campground better than you found it. We all know that we must address a huge demographic challenge so we can leave our economies and societies better than we found them. We owe this to those grandchildren that I ask you to imagine yourself with, for their own sake, for their own destiny. And I'm confident that if you, we use all these game changers, and if we continue to focus on good use of public spending through good innovations, we can do it. We all have a stake in this. Thank you.